They're going live now, Brian said. Okay. I can tell people about the QR code if you want. Yeah, perfect. All right. Uh, welcome to AC in the Cloud. I'm going to let Laurel go ahead and explain this slide for us. Hello, everybody. So this is a QR code for a copy of the presentation. So we'll leave it up for a few minutes here, um, or a couple of moments, I guess, and uh, give you a chance to download a copy of it if you'd like. And then we will get started. We will have this slide again at the end of our presentation as well. Okay, uh, thank you guys for joining us today. My name is Katie Threlkeld, and this is Laurel uh, Duber Collins. Well, we're going to present today on adolescents who use AAC uh, transition from language development to functional language. Um, so just a quick background on me. I'm a paid employee of Forbes AAC, and I'm a member of ASHA. I am a licensed ASHA certified speech language pathologist um, with over almost uh, 10 years of clinical experience in AAC and AT, and I am the educational program developer at Forbes AAC. And I am Laurel Duver Collins. I am a paid employee from the University of Missouri Healthcare System, where I'm a pediatric um, speech pathologist. I specialize in alternative and augmentative communication, specifically evaluations for kiddos who have complex access needs. Um, I'm also a member of ASHA and MISHA. Uh, I've been a speech pathologist, a clinically certified speech, speech pathologist for nearly 10 years. Um, I have about eight years experience of working in schools, uh, specifically middle schools and high schools, um, with uh, kiddos who are in specialized programs for um, social skills, functional communication, and life skills programs. All right, so today our presentation aims to review and touch base on the different intervention approaches for adolescents who use AAC. At this age, we're really starting to see the focus of treatment shifting from language development to functional language. We'll talk through some different recommendations for communication partner training for caregivers, employers, um, education staff, as well as peers on how to support AAC users. Uh, we'll talk about some different scenarios such as high turnover and support staff and community integration and we'll discuss potential solutions for those uh, scenarios. So to go ahead and get started, we'll talk kind of big, right? We know that there's approximately 5 million Americans and 97 million people in the world who may benefit from AAC. In the US, among students who support communication, uh, who need support when communicating, a national survey of special educators across all 50 states reported that 18.2% of their students use a form of AAC. So we know there's a lot of individuals out there that are using it, right? There's an expanding body of research that uh, clearly indicates that AAC interventions support improved communication outcomes for individuals who have complex communication needs across a wide range of ages and needs in order to maximize the positive outcomes of AAC interventions for these individuals. It's critical that interventions are designed to support participation within real world interactions and in natural environments. For adolescents who use AAC, research shows they demonstrate difficulties with using aided AAC to communicate effectively. And research has found that they have limited opportunities to develop conversational skills. And these are key skills needed as a, a user transitions from the uh, language development stage to that functional language stage. 
challenges have been identified by uh, research means for adolescents who use AAC. These challenges include establishing personal identity, addressing the increasing educational demands that occur as a child gets older, and then coping with the differences that they um, have from their peer group. The transition from adolescence to young adulthood is also challenging, right? They uh, have additional barriers when it is a AC communicator for them to have success in those post-secondary educational or vocational training programs or employment settings. So we, as SLPs, both Laurel and I, we know that it is our job as clinicians to be involved in that transition planning and to be providing intervention to prepare these uh, individuals as they shift from the educational setting to that workplace uh, setting and in more social environments, right? We know the goal is to maximize communication across environments. And so we really wanna make sure we're thinking about that as children get older, move into that adolescent stage. We want to make sure we're addressing communication at that level. As we consider AAC for adolescents, we also have to think about how AAC is changing in the digital world, right? Um, it, it's constantly changing. AAC, technology, assistive tech, um, you know, chat GPT, all of these things are coming out. So we have to think about the how that is affecting AAC in the field and also how that's affecting adolescents. Uh, the field of AAC has evolved, you know, substantially over the last 30, 40 years. We know AAC is introduced much earlier now. Uh, there's so much more support for clinicians and families. And the key thing is we know AAC is no longer considered that last resort, right? There's an increase in access for everyone to smart devices, to mobile technologies. And we know because of these technological advances, AAC has become more accessible. Uh, there's, you know, smartphones and tablets and different AAC apps, different software out there. And this technology can be customized. It can provide, you know, symbol-based or text-based communication capabilities. There's tons of different uh, ways to really make it meet each individual's unique communication needs. And then just thinking in general. Children now are growing up in this digital age and they have access to information and technology unlike any previous generation. Um, I remember when I was in middle school in what the mid 2000s and my family, we got our first like computer at my house and it was, I had to have weighed at least 20 pounds, right? And we did the dial up and you couldn't make a phone call. That's totally gone away, right? Children now have immediate access to information and technology. And with that, they are learning to be very engaged in tech, email, social media, uh, learning platforms in terms of the educational setting. And all these technologies continue to update. So with this digital age, it's brought tremendous advancements in AAC. It's making AAC more accessible, more portable and more personalized. Now, thinking back to AAC for adolescents, despite these technological advances in the field of AAC, there's minimal longitudinal research that describes the long-term outcomes for AAC users, particularly how looking at AAC use um, during that transition from childhood to adolescence, and then adolescence into adulthood. So we want to think about that. Um, as our society becomes more and more reliant on digital technologies and these virtual connections like what we're doing right now, uh, we know future research is going to continue to look at how these digital technologies can be leveraged by children and adolescents and adults who use AVC to support communication and social connections. The research that is available has found that there's many different factors that influence both short-term and long-term outcomes 
for individuals who use AAC into adolescence. Internal factors such as motivation, self-determination, language abilities, and cognitive skills have been identified. And then environmental factors such as family involvement, educational placement, and very importantly, AAC intervention. That is going to impact the long-term outcomes for AAC users. So what are the clinical implications? According to the National Organization on Disability, less than 21% of Americans with disabilities are employed. Among individuals with disabilities who experience complex communication needs, the rate of employment has been reported to be even lower at less than 5%. That low proportion of employment um, for those individuals who are using AAC is of course, more than likely related to the lack of effective AAC interventions and supports to meet the functional demands of participation within an individual's community, within their workplace environment, within those vocational settings. So we want to think about how intervention can target communication in really real-world And for us to be able to have that conversation about how these sessions need to look, we need to start with talking about what typical sessions look like now. Um, most of the research that we currently have focuses on those beginning phases of AAC use um, and just some of the pieces that we need to kind of keep in mind to grow those skills that we need so those transitions into adolescence and adulthood and into workplaces can go more smoothly. So to start off, some of the things that um, I tell my parents during AAC evaluations and during the early days of learning how to use a communication device are to think of a AAC as like a hearing aid, but for the voice. So a hearing aid allows um, kids who need it to be able to you know, amplify the sound around them. It doesn't give them receptive language capabilities. They still have to learn how to listen and they still have to learn what those language components mean in the same way that a communication device does not, it, it gives a child a way to have their voice be heard, but it doesn't teach them how to use that voice. And for that, we still need those language therapy components. Um, there are specific types of therapy that are recommended. Finding a therapist who specializes in communication devices, specializes in those early AAC processes, is the best way to really get started when it's possible to be able to use a device. And I just kind of let them know that there are high abandonment rates when it comes to communication devices. Um, I'm not talking about the kids who have apraxia and their speech improves and so they no longer require a communication device, but the families where it is a proper fit for the child, but due to lack of education, due to um, uh, in experience or an unawareness on family caregivers or on educational staff, the device is not being used appropriately, and so devices end up being abandoned. Um, so our gold standard for uh, AAC therapy is core and fringe. It has been since the 90s. This is just where we start. It gives us the biggest bang for our buck. Um, if you search for core and fringe vocabulary lessons for ideas, you will find so many things um, from core books to cooking activities to games. There are some wonderful sites for parents that talk about modeling and how to use core and how to use fringe in all different types of the day. And this is a wonderful place to start. And it's that necessity where we do start to be able to have the skills to be able to grow. Um, we're going to start moving past the things that are easily Googleable. Um, these are still important features when talking about communication devices and users who use communication devices, um, but they tend to get forgotten sometimes. Um, things like being able to charge a communication device, knowing how to power it on and off, knowing how to do the software updates when they need to or how to check for software updates, just those additional challenges that arise with AAC use that um, it's just not a one-to-one -one correspondence for those kids who are able to use their voice to be able to speak. Um, and additional things like updating social words and people as kids move from one class to another or if they switch schools, just being able to update the fringe vocabulary in general. Um, if they used to play soccer and now they're really into football, there's a whole realm of fringe vocabulary that has to be changed with that. 
And then really kind of deciding what is the AAC user's role in these changes and in these operational pieces with the device and what needs to be the role of the people in their lives as well? And how does that change as the AAC user gets older? What we expect a five-year-old to do with their communication device should not be what we expect a 15-year-old to do with their device as far as operational and social pieces of it and being able to advocate for themselves. Um, the DAG2 I put on here, this is a wonderful little tool that's free um, that kind of has a bunch of questions to help you figure out goal writing if it's something you're not familiar with um, to kind of hit on all of these different aspects of communication device in general. And they have some really good sections on the social and operational components of using a device. We are now going to start getting away from those typical AAC ses sessions and really start to look on that language growth component. So once we know how to use a device, once we know where those words are located or how to find those words, if we don't know where they are, where do we go from there? And we, this is where we really start with the language development piece. So increasing MLU, increasing syntax, being able to incorporate um, the grammatical components to really start to bring together the use of the communication device and to make it more conversational whenever it is getting used. Um, there is some really good research through uh, Binger Kent Walsh um, about generative language intervention, where they discuss different ways to measure MLU, looking at complexity of um, what is being said through a communication device. And so to really kind of treat, I'm sorry, um, to teach the complexity of the uh, conversation and not just how many words are you saying. Um, to be able to do this stage, to be able to work on increasing the MLU and increasing the syntax, we need to make sure that the device that the child has is a linguistically robust device. Um, this is not going to be possible for every child. Everybody is different and their ability to use devices is going to be at their ability. But for the rest of this conversation, um, what we are talking about, we are making the assumption that a child or that an adolescent has a linguistically robust device. What this means, um, I got this from one of my favorite websites, Practical AAC. Um, these are some um, pieces that Gail Van Tatenhoven and Carol Zingari put together to describe what a linguistically robust system looks like. Um, and it's just that ability to make those morphological changes, having more than 300 core words, having that wide range of word classes, um, supporting that motor automaticity, and then also having that plan for the growth as language continues to evolve, and then having that word prediction and text-to-speech pieces as well. There are a lot of different systems out there that meet these qualifications. Um, but the rest of our conversations, like I said, are going to work under the assumption that the devices we use are these clinically robust systems. So how can this look in a, a school setting or in a work setting? Um, I worked at a school here in Columbia, it's called Smithton Middle School, and we put together a coffee shop for our kids um, where they would sell coffee to the teachers at the middle school. We started it in sixth grade, and by the time the sixth graders were going off to high school, we then continued the coffee shop to work at the high school level. We were called Smithton Sips at the middle school, and then we switched it to Cup of Spartan when we went to battle, because, you know, you have to keep that school pride. Um, we, in sixth grade, we started with very basic scripts. Here you go, have a good day. We worked on being able to ask for orders, asking for locations of rooms. Um, we worked on providing change for the coffee orders, being able to direct other people using their device if somebody was lost in the hall, um, navigating a school or a room using the device, um, being able to advocate for themselves if teachers or other students saw them in the hall. And every year we would just kind of add on a few more skills that would be necessary to be able to run a coffee shop in this capacity. By the time they got to high school, this is a picture of what our order board would look like at the high school on any given day. So um, on the left were the teachers and then the room numbers, what type of drink they were doing. We started using um, initialisms in shortcut uh, writing. So what kind of creamers, was it French vanilla, was it original? On this day, everybody liked French vanilla. 
um, if they wanted sugars, if so, what type and how much, and then the initials of the student that would be making that order. So kids could also start working on um, their own order of operations, looking for their own job in a cog that was kind of continuing to work. We also started to have um, student uh, managers. So we would have like a Bobby would go and tell everybody else, you know, what their jobs needed to be if they weren't paying attention to their jobs. And for seven years, these kids really learned how to run a coffee shop using their communication devices and to get all these really good vocational skills. And as they were getting close to graduation, we, we didn't really know what to do. And we were approached by a company here in Missouri called Love Inc., which is a nonprofit organization that um, focuses on providing jobs for underemployed uh, populations. And they told us that they wanted to open a coffee shop here in town. And so they came to the high school and they kind of looked at what we were doing and how we were running our coffee shop. And we got a whole coffee shop opened up in our city because of our little school-based enterprise that we did to be able to have kids learn how to have a job with their communication devices. Um, and it survived COVID. We're, it's four years old now, this coffee shop is, and I still have some friends that I had when I was at the high school that still work there today. And it's just really great to be able to see those kids kind of grow and flourish and use their communication devices in this way that is just so functional and it's just brought so much meaning to what they do. I love the story about the coffee shop. And uh, like you said, it's it survived COVID, which is a testament. Um, so we talked about uh, kind of intervention and thinking about what the typical sessions look like. Uh, how we start to adapt and change those for children as they move into that adolescent stage. We also have to think about more specific um, challenges that are faced by adolescents. When we think about this developmental period, it's typically identified as occurring between the ages of 10 and approximately 20 years old. And as most of us have probably experienced, it's a time of significant change, right? significant physiological and psychological change. And for, you know, adolescents is hard enough for adolescents who use AAC. They face not only the typical uh, challenges of adolescence, but also other factors. So according to Smith, uh, challenges faced by adolescents who use AAC include establishing personal identity, maintaining emotional and mental health stability, coping with increasing educational demands, and then also learning to cope with the fact that their communication differs from their peers. So um, according to Turkstra, the physical appearance becomes central to personal identity for adolescents. They are beginning to cope with their physical and physiological changes that are occurring during this time. For AAC users, we think about the cosmetic features of their AAC system, how that uh, makes them different than their peers, right? Research has found that it's not uncommon that at this stage, a, uh, an AAC system may be rejected or ignored at this time because of its appearance and because of the fact that it represents a difference between what is considered you know, typical in their peer group. And that's a challenge. And that's something we can assist with, right? What can we do? We can incorporate peers in therapy to, uh, to facilitate group interactions um, and, and practice communicating about their AAC system with their peers. We want to ensure that their AAC system has the words or phrases available for them to communicate about their system, right? I use this to talk. Um, I use this um, in the classroom, those type of phrases and messages and, and practice those. Another challenge is uh, that's been identified for adolescents who use AAC is maintaining that emotional and mental health stability, right? Communication impairment is considered a risk factor for mental health disorders across the lifespan. It's vital that AAC users in this age have access to effective and safe communication supports. Uh, we want to think about, you know, making sure that these supports are 
uh, available both because it will give us information into the adolescent's emotional health status, and it also uh, facilitates the you know, formal or informal discussions with peers, with adults, with clinicians, um, in terms of conversations around emotional and mental health, right? We really want to ensure that we're providing and engaging in meaningful discussion uh, related to the adolescent's concerns and ensuring that they have the, the vocabulary and the language to talk about these different um, emotional and mental health, um, <laughs> talk about their emotional and mental health. And then of course, you know, this is, is key, right? We see as children move into that adolescent stage, educational demands just continue to increase. You know, you go from um, reading, uh, learning to read to reading to learn, and that just continues to magnify as uh, children move into middle school and then into high school, right? There's a significant increase in vocabulary needed for school tasks. So what can we do? We want to ensure that the AAC user has within the system they're using the required vocabulary needed for school tasks. Work as a team, work with, um, you know, the, the teacher, the other clinicians around them, their peers, and find out what language uh, maybe isn't available and then start to incorporate that into therapeutic activities. And then finally, um, you know, this is key. Being an adolescent is hard enough, right? Uh, then we add in the fact that you have this system, uh, uh, whether it's a you know, speech generating device, um, a low tech device, a communication board, whatever it is, that is something that makes them markedly different from their peers, right? And when you're 14 years old, no one wants to be different, right? Everyone just wants to fit in. And this difference can make, um, you know, it adds to the challenges of being an adolescent. It can make that transition uh, from childhood to adolescence to adulthood uniquely different. So we want to think about how we can um, provide solutions at this stage. We want to make sure that we are uh, continuing to have those open conversations about these differences include peers, include siblings, include those that are around them, include other AAC communicators so that they can talk about this together and have conversations and be supports for one another. Um, so kind of in culmination, we are gonna move into some more ideas about strategies for adolescents who use AAC. As I said, the focus of speech therapy at this age is really shifting from, um, you know, language development to more functional communication. And with that, we're shifting from the idea of uh, communication in the educational setting. We're moving to communication in that workplace environment and, you know, social environments. Um, and we really want to think about that when we are writing goals when we are coming up with intervention strategies and when we are incorporating therapeutic activities. How can we maximize an AAC user's communication across these different environments and make sure we're addressing these challenges when we're thinking about transition planning? Um, by the time AAC users move into adolescence, we're really, again, thinking about that shift from education to workplace and social environments, we're really thinking about how we can move from language development to functional language. So we are working towards intervention that is targeting communication as well as social skills in the school setting, while also including organized vocational experiences, such as what Laurel talked about, the amazing coffee shop that they started that really allowed for the um, AC users to learn these communication skills needed needed in a vocational uh, setting. And then they're also still getting to be in school and incorporating those skills together. 
Um, some general clinical observations for this age specifically. Um, independence is a very important part of being an adolescent, feeling like you can be independent and do things on your own. It's a part that a lot of our AAC users can have difficulty with. Prompt dependency is rampant and um, having ideas built in when kids are younger to be able to work on scaffolding away that prompt dependency before we hit adolescence. Um, it cannot be un understated. Like it's, it's just it's so important to these kids. Social language is also very important. Think about TikTok. Um, think about slang and cussing. Things that, while it may not be school appropriate, it's things that you would hear teenagers say and teenagers do. Having conversations with parents like, hey, I know you don't want them to drop an F-bomb, but what's a more 17-year-old thing to do than cuss out your parents and slam the door behind you? And we want these kids to have that same opportunity to cuss out their family, just like any other teenager would. Um, I have one friend that I currently see, and he was spelling out every cuss word he wanted on his device. And so I told mom, I was like, listen, we could really speed this up for him and we can just put it into his device. And then he doesn't have to spell it out each time. And the look on his face when he got to hit just a single button and it'd say his favorite curse words, it just it just lit up his day. <laughs> it just made him so happy. Um, and then Katie talked about this as well, that social pressure and constraint. Kids really want to fit in at this age and having a device is it's it's an other. It makes them different. And so doing what we can to kind of facilitate that and to help make it as normalized as possible. Um, in as uncringy of a way as possible. You know, it's one of those things at this age where when an adult tells you to do it, you don't want to do it, right? And so utilizing those peer groups, utilizing those other students that might be around to be able to help bridge that gap and to make this normal is the best way to do it. Another piece that we really need to consider at this age is health and sex when it comes to AAC. Having the ability to have the words necessary to talk about health and to talk about sex in not only a medical way, but for those kids who do want to do dating and to be able to have those conversations and have them safely. Um, the best way to mitigate um, uh, any difficulties around sex and health education is to have the vocabulary that you need to be able to talk about it. My body, my choice, being able to know things like they say no and I say okay, having those black and white rules with advocacy, having those words in a device and having them be um, the biologically correct words in the device so kids can talk about questions that they have or things that they're experiencing um, is the best thing that we can do to help mitigate abuse. And being able, feeling comfortable advocating at the school level, if you do work in the schools for sex ed or for health classes, for district-wide programs or for SPED classrooms. Um, these are underfunded programs at this level anyway. And there's also a high opt-out rate from families because they just get very uncomfortable thinking about their kids having to go through these lessons. Um, and so just being able to provide that education of why it is important. We are not health teachers. We should not be the ones providing all of the education here, but being able to advocate why it is important and why we need it. Um, another piece to kind of consider is that different devices are set up in different language learning styles. It's not just the different symbols that we have to kind of keep into account. So really quickly here, I'm gonna just run through three of the more commonly seen language learning styles that you might come across with devices. Um, this first one, there's a picture of Lamp Words for Life and a picture of Toby Dynavox's new Motor Plan 66. These are both motor-based learning style programs. The idea is that um, you don't even have to be looking at the screen to know where the words are. The words don't move. If they do move, they come back to where they are pretty close, pretty quickly. So it really goes into that motor planning component. And for those kids who are motor plan learners, these tend to be devices that are great for them. Both of these devices um, show examples for uh, scripted based speech or Gestalt language processors. The one on the left is a modified uh, touch chat program where somebody was able to put in the scripts um, that a child uses. And the one on the right is uh, from Toby Dynavox. Again, it is their motor, not their motor place, I'm sorry, their, uh, just their TD Snap 
they have quick topics and they have the ability to add your own phrases within their quick topics. Um, so this is where a single button, you know, provides the whole script, being able to split up the scripts for the different stages of GLP. It's also great for the social components if you have a kid that is very social and wants to be heard but doesn't want to take the time to make out their whole sentence where they can kind of pre-program in what they want. And then the one that is most common in our area, at least, is the devices that follow just that normal language acquisition. They kind of go through like the brown stages of language development. Um, the examples that are given here are NovaChat, probably a 108, and then a Proloquo to go. So these are the ones that would, you know, put similar words together. They might have page jumps to be able to go from like verbs to um, like a groups where the specific fringe vocabulary is going to be. Um, and these are also the devices that caregivers tend to uh, be the most familiar with and have the most comfort with as well, because the way that the language is organized is the way that a lot of caregivers feel comfortable with that language system being organized as well. And then the next couple slides, I, we just want to talk a little bit about some of the strategies that are maybe more well known, but from the perspective of working with an EAC user who's an adolescent, right? Um, wait time, as we know, is key. And when we think about wait time for adolescents who use AAC, they are to the point where they are putting together longer messages. So this is when wait time becomes more and more important. We don't want to be talking for them, talking over them, or finishing their message, right? It's essential we allow time for the AAC user to communicate their intended message. We also want to presume competence, right? Um, I always think of this when I, I'm a big golfer and I'll take my friends out to golf and they're like, this is so frustrating. Why do you do this? I don't enjoy this. And I have to remind them I've been golfing since I was like three, right? I don't just wake up and know how to golf. And it's, uh, you know, the situation where we want to wait, provide opportunities, presume competence, but also know we need to be teaching and modeling for them. So presume AAC users have something to say, provide modeling as needing, and then also think about, yes, we are presuming competence and we're also teaching them uh, so they can learn more words, more phrases, uh, more communicative functions. I think it's also important to be flexible. Um, as uh, Laurel said, as these individuals get into adolescence, they're talking about more, you know, um, topics that might not be part of the therapy plan, right? That might not have been in your, um, the activities you plan for the therapy session today, but that's okay. It's things they want to communicate about. So be flexible, adapt to the communicate, uh, communication opportunity and adapt to the situation as needed. Communication is about autonomy and allowing for, uh, AC users to talk about they want to talk about it and share their message. And then this one's key. Uh, it's one of my favorites. We want to accept all forms of communication, right? We want to acknowledge, respect, and um, uh, accept whether it's, you know, a head nod, a gesture. Um, maybe they're just blatantly ignoring. It. I can guarantee all of you at some point when you were 14, probably ignored as an adult that was speaking to you and that's okay, right? Uh, that's their right as a, a communicator. So definitely accept all forms of communication. Um, we also wanna make sure we have AAC available. We want to uh, think about that from the adolescent perspective. We're thinking about, um, you know, making sure if they are, you know, maybe they're on the swim team. We want to make sure we have some sort of low tech AAC system that can be um, available for them at the swim meet. Maybe we want to think about how we can provide low tech options or light tech options as needed. Again, modeling, we're continuing to model at this age. As we said, those educational demands are growing um, and they are um, increasing. And so we do need to continue to model and teach that new vocabulary and those new language concepts. Um, and then another great one is comment rather than question. And, um, you know, that ties into the one on the last slide, teach, don't test. We are really wanting to uh, 
um, demonstrate how to be a good communication partner. And being a good communication partner means we're not just constantly saying, well, what did you do? Well, where did you go? Well, what did you see? Well, what time did you do? It? Right? Just comment, discuss, uh, describe the things you see, comment about the message they just communicated. Uh, think about these different strategies, but from the perspective of working with uh, and you know, being in an intervention uh, or a therapy session, doing intervention, but from the perspective of an adolescent. Go ahead, Paloma. Okay, so our last little bit here, we have some roadblock scenarios that are specific to um, adolescence and early adulthood that you might come across um, in your treatment lives. Um, and we're going to present some possible solutions to some of these roadblocks. Um, just a reminder that we have that Slack available. Um, if there are any specific roadblocks, if we have time at the end here that anybody wants to talk about, feel free to put them into the Slack. If you have any ideas for any um, answers to any of these roadblocks that we don't talk about, also add those because these are just from our experience that we've come up with solutions. We're not saying these are the only solutions. Um, and this is what's great about having a platform like this is to be able to really share those ideas with some of these difficult things that do come across. So um, let's say that you have a parent that says to you, there are just so many people that work with my child. He's got respite caregivers, several nurses, therapy staff, daycare workers, and they all keep changing all the time. I just am constantly repeating myself with the same information over and over. It's easier to just not have to use this device because every time I turn around, I'm having to explain to somebody else how to use it. And I, I just don't have time for that. What can you do? So there are a couple of different options that are available. Um, the first one is self-advocacy. What can we teach the, the teenager, the child, to be able to advocate about themselves? Can we put little blurbs into their device that explain what it's for, how to use it? Um, what is the what are the pieces that a child can take care of themselves? Do they still need somebody to help plug it in? Do they still need somebody to check to see if it needs to be plugged in or if they need software updates? Is this something that they're able to take care of themselves? Um, rely on your village. All of the major AAC companies where you can buy high-tech devices through insurance have representatives for uh, the different states that will provide free trainings to people in an AAC user's life about not just how to use the device, but also like how to communicate with device users as well. Um, you can also rely on current support staff or other family members. If there's going to be a nurse change, maybe asking the nurse what are the important aspects of the device that somebody else would need to know. Um, not everybody needs to know everything about the device. So just kind of hitting on what's specific for each of the different specific job titles might take some of that stress off. The other piece, um, and this is one that I recommend to families constantly, are uh, communication passports. These can be printouts, they can be digital. They're just like a too long didn't read a TLDR about a kid um, and about their communication style or things that are important to them. Um, maybe you have somebody that has a specific yes, no system that they do to answer questions. And when they blink, it's a yes. And when they tap their toe, it's a no. Um, a communication passport can put that information in there. Maybe they, absolutely hate it when you sing the happy birthday song. And so there's no quicker way to have a meltdown than the happy birthday song. Putting that into a communication passport would also be good to know. Um, there are a ton of free resources out there to be able to make communication passports. You should not have to buy one. So a uh, Google will give you a bunch of different options, making it just as functional as it needs to be for your family is the best thing you can do. And then I recommend that once a year, families just kind of look at it and update the information, update the pictures as kids get older and, you know, the way that they look change and the people around them change to have it be the most up-to-date information. Here's another example of a communication passport. This one's one that's available in grid three um, for through Smartbox. So if you have a kid who's already using a Smartbox program, to um, as a communication device, they have a built-in communication passport in there. Here is another roadblock. My child is about to graduate school. He is on Medicaid right now, and I'm worried that Medicaid won't pay for services once he graduates. 
What am I supposed to do when he long, no longer has a school SLP to help with this device? This is a big one. This is one that I hear pretty regularly from parents. Um, and it is important to recognize that audiology and speech language pathology services are mandatory for children, but they are optional for adults. Every state has flexibility to determine how they will meet that mandatory requirement in terms of what qualifies an individual for the services that are provided. So this is also an answer that's going to um, vary greatly depending on what state you're in and depending on what services are available for your state. The main thing that I would do is think about what are the major areas that need to be addressed while therapy is still covered. And I start having this conversation with families when kids are 13 or 14 years old. It's that, what do you see them doing after high school conversation? Do you see them working as a greeter at their favorite store? Okay, then we need to really work on social skills and we need to work on how to ask those social questions. Do you see them working in a library, wanting to organize books? Then we need to be able to um, ask questions and advocate if they get lost in what they're supposed to do. Um, are they going to be in a dayhab facility or a dayhab program where they're going to be doing outings with friends? Great, then we need to work on the social pieces that would be needed for that or to be able to advocate for activities that they like and don't like. Colleges and university programs are also a really good resource for this age group. Um, those of us who are speech pathologists know that, uh, you know, most colleges and universities that have SLP programs have clinics that are run that have graduate student clinicians. Um, and they usually don't take insurance. They're done on a sliding scale or they're done um, at a less expensive cost to kind of support the needs of the graduate students. Um, and they're a wonderful resource for this age group. I also tell parents to start exploring options now. Things that are available tend to have wait lists and those wait lists tend to take years. A lot of the programs you have to have guardianship um, before you qualify for them and guardianship waitlist also take a long time to be able to get in front of a judge. Being able to talk with a regional support, um, like a caseworker or a case manager that's available through like the Department of Mental Health um, is a great way to kind of help navigate some of these situations. Um, after you've experienced enough of them, you might start to have a few like websites in your back pocket that you might give to parents or things like that to kind of help navigate these um, this is one where parents have a really difficult time talking about it a lot of the times. It's one of those last big transitions right around graduation, and there's a lot of pushback of, I don't want to talk about this yet. It's not time to talk about this yet. And so just as politely and kindly as you can, continuing to bring it up and remind them that it's not going to go away just because they don't want to talk about it, and having a plan that you can prepare for now will save you from the stress of not having a plan when you blink and they're 19 and oh crap what do we do now um another roadblock that is one that happens a lot is one like my child received her device when she was 15 she is now 22 and it's not working so we just don't use it anymore one of the downsides of using tech is that it's going to become obsolete um, if a child got their device at a young age, this is probably going to be their third or fourth device. Families are probably going to know what to do at that point. But there's a lot of kids that don't get one until they're able to prove through those low tech methods that they can use one. And so those kids, this really might only be their second device by the time they hit this age to be able to need a replacement. Um, and if it is the first aging device of this transition period, parents are going to have a lot of questions. And if you don't do evaluations for devices regularly, you probably aren't going to know the answers to them. Until I started at the job that I currently have, I had no idea what the eval process looked like. I had no idea how insurance was involved or what the specific requirements were for different insurances. It just wasn't part of my job. And so if a parent asked me this question back then, I would not have had an answer for them. <laughs> but I have an answer now. Um, tech support for most devices is up to five years, and insurance will pay for a new device once every five to seven years. You do need to know who in your area does evaluations for communication devices, and if they do them just for pediatrics or if they do them for adults. 
Um, Medicaid tends to have specific requirements, again, depending on your state, on who can do the evaluation, but most other insurances are fine with just a speech pathologist being the one completing it. And the major AAC companies all have templates that you can use to be able to make those requests yourself. Um, if you are, you know, working in private practice and you have a child who needs a new device. Know that it is a long process and have plans for a backup while the process is going on. Um, from the date of evaluation to the final date of a child getting their device right now for most companies is taking anywhere between four and six months. So if a family doesn't come to you to after a device is already broken and they're expecting one tomorrow, know that that may not be the case. Um, and just having a backup while everything else is taken care of is really important. Are there any other scenarios in the Slack or any other questions that anybody has? Okay, I'm looking at it now and I don't see any Laurel. Uh, so if anyone has anything you'd like to chat about, feel free or questions, go ahead and put them um, in the Slack chat. And if uh, you want, we can do the conclusion slide and, and see yeah. if anyone adds in. Um, so yeah, uh, as we've talked about kind of in conclusion, you know, thinking about that big kind of transition, childhood to adolescence, and then adolescence into adulthood. We want to think about um, that transition into adult roles in the workforce. This is going to require communication, and it's going to require different types of communication skills than what are maybe typically addressed. So we want to think about how we can incorporate goals, incorporate therapeutic activities that are going to target communication that is much more focused on um, communication that can be utilized in the workforce, vocational uh, settings, out and about in the community. As an individual gets older, communicating wants and needs becomes less important. Uh, communicating with the goal of social closeness and information transfer becomes much more important. And that's where we want to see that transition. We want to move from, you know, um, more of that kind of uh, pediatric childhood language model where we're doing a lot of language development and really moving towards that functional communication perspective that we've talked about. So, Thank um, so much for attending today, everybody. Yeah, and a lot. I don't Go see ahead. any other, I would say, I don't see any other questions, but. Um, okay. Here is uh, that QR code one more time. If anybody didn't get a chance to do it earlier and wanted a copy of the presentation, we will also upload a copy um, where they're going for all the other programs as well too today. So there'll Perfect. be a copy of it online as well. Well, we do have one here. Um, are there any SLP jobs that support aged out adults or is that something that needs to be explored by state? Um, I think it's probably something that needs to be explored by state. Mm -hmm. uh, any Great. adult SLPs would have that ability if you have somebody who works with adults to be able to see those aged out adults. But it's definitely one of those gaps where it seems like from 20 to 40, it's really difficult to get those speech services unless you have like a car accident or a brain injury of some kind. Yeah, I think that's consistent with where the research is too, right? We have a lot of research focused on language development in AAC. Um, and then we have AAC for individuals with acquired communication disorders. Um, but we, we have a gap um, both from a research standpoint, from a clinical um, expertise standpoint, for this exact period that we're discussing. And so, um, yeah, like the question, I agree with you, well, it's definitely, you know, I would say area specific, um, but we're trained and uh, that's part of our scope of practice. Yep. Um, well, cool, that's the, that's the only question I see so far, so. Um, We'll definitely get the slides added in and you can use that QR code if that's not working. And Laurel and I really appreciate you attending today. Um.
Yes, would... make sure you fill out the survey after uh, this session. If you have any additional questions or anything, feel free to put them in there and we'll be able to get to them as well. Absolutely. All right. Thank you guys and have a great Wednesday. Thank you.